Hi everyone, welcome to Hubshots episode 302. In this episode, we talk about social and campaign calendars, sequence views, workflow schedules, snappy headlines, and can you believe it, child theme limitations. Now, on to our growth thought of the week, Craig. Tell me about what the growth thought is. You know how I try to start with something a little bit insightful and maybe yes. some trends that we're noticing. Well, this is just a fun one. Did you know the expression, what's if, isn't a thing? You probably did. Most listeners are like, that's not a word. No, I didn't. I well, was reading I, I, it when you put it in there. I use it all the time. I say, what's if we do this? You know, what's if we watch that? It's not a word because what's if basically is... is abbreviation of what is if why am i mentioning this well my my wife we were having one of those little heart to hearts and she said you know what it kind of annoys me. <laughs> irritates me when you say what's if it's not a thing anyway i've been saying that for 25 years Ian. and michelle finally said you know can you just not say that by the way the other thing i say is something i don't pronounce the word something correctly All right yeah I, these are the blind spots we have anyway i that's why i value people giving me feedback and things like that so if you ever hear me say something, something or something, <laughs> I, I can't even say it wrong now. But anyway, in other news, uh, supposedly is actually a word. And if there's any Friends fans listening or watching, you'll remember this. It is actually a word. It just gets used incorrectly. Uh, anyway, is that a growth thought of the week? No. How do I try and make this something relevant? Well, <laughs> the best I could do was say, <laughs> test your assumptions. And be open to the fact that something that you've held as an understanding or perhaps common wisdom for so long might actually be totally wrong. That's right. Won't labor it on. On to much more interesting things though, Ian. That's right. The They Ask You Answer Summit in Asia Pacific is happening. And thanks to Moby and Tasha, Red Pandas. And the team are hosting it in Australia in October. And can you believe it? Marcus Sheridan is flying down to be one of the speakers as the author of the book of course so and if you haven't read the book to be honest i would recommend reading it or listening to it on audible it's it is a great book and as for our listeners um moby has kindly given us 50 percent discount on all tickets if you use the code hubshots link in the show notes and link in the if you're watching this on youtube link in the description We've already bought our tickets. And by the way, we have bought tickets. We weren't given these as freebies. We're not promoting this, you know, because we've got free tickets or anything. We've purchased our tickets. Use that same co coupon code that we use to get half price. Marcus Sheridan's going to be fantastic. I'm really looking forward to this. It's at the end of October. It's in Sydney. Uh, even if you don't live in Sydney, it'd be worth flying up to get this. This is fantastic. We've talked about the book before on the show. Highly recommended. So, yep. That's See right. You there. It's a it's at Olympic Park, so it's easy to get to. There's plenty of parking, so not a problem. Plenty of free parking too, apparently. That's so, right. Yeah, great. All right. And uh, and uh, can you believe it, Craig? We were thankfully, we were very thankful to George B. Thomas, who had us as guests on the Hub Heroes, along with the team at Red Pandas. So uh, thank you, George. And it is episode 42 of the Hub Heroes podcast, where he talks about uh, well, we had a discussion about inbound 23 and how to get prepared, especially if you're traveling from overseas into Boston for inbound. It was a great chat. We had a lot of fun. Thanks for having us on, George, and go and listen to the show. It was fantastic. All right. On to some quick shots of the week, Craig. Now, here are a few things that I've noticed. We've got some redesigned HubSpot template marketplace where they can offer modules. Now, this was there before. It's come back again. So it's it's there for everyone to use. I've noticed, um, especially for clean theme, we've got a few modules from there uh, from Helpful Hero. That's a, just giving a shout out to Kevin and the great work that he does. Did you know Inbound Calling is there, Craig, and now has a dedicated window? So this was a little bit of a bugbear before. So now you can actually, it's got a separate window that it sits in. So when that window is open, you can receive and make calls. And it'll tell you if you, if you can't because it's not there. The second thing we want to highlight is working hours and custom voicemail. So we've started using this. You kindly did a test. 
at the end of the day. And the voicemail is actually you type it in and then it converts it from text to speech. Craig, you did you did say it was annoying that uh, when you call me to get an American accent on the other end, I'm sure this will change over time. But you know what? Great place to start. And so I encourage you, if you've got sales pro, sales enterprise, set this up. Start using it, get people using it as a way to make sure you're logging things into HubSpot, but also gives people a way to contact you because if people call in using the HubSpot number, that'll get logged into HubSpot. So well worth it, it'll get transcribed as well. Finally, we have um, AI powered location formatting suggestions for contacts, companies, and you need to have ops operations data Pro Enterprise. And so this is a nice little feature um, I've taken. We've got Ops Data. And so this is available to you. It picks up things um, like names that are the characters, are, like they're all uppercase or maybe there's punctuation in the, in the name. Maybe the name has first and last name are like the same. So it can go, oh, hang on, like I've got one there that says it's Fernando Fernando. Um, this this was a first name in instance, but it does pick that up. And the sec and the second thing is email. So things that might be throwaway emails would might be one of them. And finally, location. So understanding the location details of that contact and and it suggests some pre fills. So you can also bulk select and apply all changes or reject all changes. Was this always in starter, or is this no? Stuff from it Pro wasn't Craig. And I think starter. I think this is a part of the AI powered stuff that's rolling out so it was the first time i had seen it and i had to play with it so i think it's a great to be honest it's a great addition to starter and i think mm. if you have hubspot and you don't have operations data i think it's worth getting yeah i agree with that i think starter's worth getting i still don't really have my head around ops pro or ops enterprise they say i just can't see the value of them myself that's a from ignorance i say that not as like a Strong evaluation, but yeah, it's not clear to me. Whereas this is, you know, these oh, these should be in starter. They shouldn't have been pro features. So I'm really glad to see this rolling out. And yeah, op starter becomes a bit of a no brainer for everyone. All right, what's our marketing feature of the week, Craig? Let's look at calendars in HubSpot. And I think most listeners would know about the social calendar. Maybe not the campaign calendar. So there's two separate calendars. We've got screenshots in the show notes. Make sure you sign up for the show notes. By the way. Send them out, lots of details, lots of screenshots, lots of extra stuff that we don't get to cover in the show. But one of the things that we might say, because we, we schedule a lot of social, I've got in the screenshot some of our social for our Zen Create uh, campaign or um, brand. And why would you use maybe the social calendar versus the campaign calendar? And the answer is for social, you're probably going to stick with the social calendar because it's, it shows more if you click on a social thing in the calendar, it'll show an image, etc. But the campaign calendar, which might be new uh, to some people, you can actually include a whole bunch more events on it. You can include social as well, but you can include all other things, and you can selectively choose them. So you might say, just show me tasks, or just show me actual campaigns and as they run along. And that highlights one thing you were mentioning when you were showing me this earlier, Ian, that the importance of putting the dates, you know, you've been able to put start and end date in campaigns. It's like, exactly. oh, where does that show up? What's that effect? Well, it shows on the calendar. Yeah. So you can see how many campaigns you're running. So just another incremental improvement. And so the calendar, I think this is going to get more use. I'm slightly worried they're going to sunset the social calendar and not bring over some of the features. And the reason I say that is because they're rolling out views in the campaign calendar. They're Correct. not putting that in the social calendar. It's yep. not getting much love. So I'm slightly worried. So that would be a little bit of a downgrade for me in terms of social management. But overall and everything else, it's far superior, the campaign calendar, I think. Would you agree, Ian? Yeah, I would agree, Craig. And I think if they could bring what is in the social calendar into the campaign calendar, then, of course, it makes sense to have it in here. Mm. Now... I could also understand if people are using tools, let's say you're all you do is social, you probably just want to see the social calendar. So yeah. kind of is interesting because um, you might not want to see or go and filter all the other things out. Um, the big thing is you can't see images. So you could see a lot of the social posts. You can see the text. You can't see images. So that's where 
using the social calendar is better. But you've got you pulled out some good uh, pros and cons, right, Craig? Yeah, well, that's right, and that's a bit of a summary of what we've just discussed. But in the campaigns, you can create views, so you could go to the campaign calendar, only show social events, and then save that as a view. I think that's what they'll say. They'll get rid of the social calendar and say, "I'll just create a social view that it pre-defaults to," or something like that. Yeah. But yeah. But I guess also thinking uh, about it, so listeners, we probably didn't stipulate this. If you're listening. You can see things like blogs, the campaign's new and that's where the date really matters. You can see emails that are being triggered. You can see Facebook, Google, LinkedIn ad campaigns that are on there. So I'd actually never realized that was there. So that was a nice little addition, which I discovered while going through this. Marketing events, if you're using marketing events, recurring emails, and of course, tasks and website pages. So that's, they're kind of like the main things. That's what I want to say because... I was talking to a customer and I was like, they said, oh, where can we see all of this stuff? And I was looking at the social calendar. I was like, I can't find it. What is it? Was it here? Did it not appear there? But now we found it and it's and it's all there. So the, my only thing is, is that say we wanted to share this with people in the business, for example, right? Let's say we wanted to share. And so people could see what was going on. There's actually nowhere to share it. So you'd have to log in to HubSpot, go to this particular part of HubSpot to view what was going on. So that's probably my only gripe or suggestion may, may be. What would you to, like it to be? What do you mean share it? You mean like in a report or something? Yeah, like in a report. Oh, like okay, I just yeah, want to see a calendar of, oh, what posts are going out, what emails are going out, maybe what campaigns are running because we can see now campaigns are running from particular dates So maybe yeah. there are social posts that are related to that campaign. Um, so it that's what I was thinking. Interesting what they do with, you know, if you haven't got a, if you've haven't got one of the marketing seats, and you've just got the view only seat. Yeah. Um, whether you can actually, yeah, whether they can see that. I assume they mm. would like a view only version of it. I'll have to test. I'm that. not sure, but I, I guess this is like with anything, right? Like mm. you can't view. Oh, you could share a link to a dashboard, but you got to be able to log in to view that. Yeah. Um. There's no way to nicely wrap it up and email it to somebody like it does on a dashboard. So, right. But you know what? Down the line, that may happen. Who knows? So, listeners, be aware. The two different places where you can see calendars and there's a link to the Knowledge Base article that's there. All right. Now we're going to go to sales. And the sales pitch of the week is... doesn't seem complicated, but when you're sending a lot of sequences... Try to figure out who they've been sent to and when was the last thing they've been sent and what's going to happen next is really important. So let me, I'll take a step back and say this came from a customer who does a lot of outreach and they use sequences. So they're, they're in the construction industry. They reach out to people, to potential people who are building. So they're using a system to get data out of who has got what projects. So there could be multiple architects, there could be multiple quantity surveyors and so on. So they know all of these people are working on projects and they want to reach out to them because they provide services to these people's environmental services, right? There could be multiple people or multiple companies on particular projects. And so they're reaching out to say, hey, do you need assistance with this? They're putting people into sequences, but as the data is growing and they're now going, okay, well, we know that there are these projects with these involved companies and individuals. How do we know that we already haven't sent a sequence to this person when a new project comes along? So it was like, okay, let's try this. And they're working because they're bulk enrolling. So let's create a contact. Uh, let's create a view, right? One of the things we, we uh, put in the contact view is having columns like, is the contact currently in the sequence? When was the last sequence end date? When and then what was the last sequence that was enrolled? So that was really important to see what the last sequence because they've got multiple sequences that people potentially go through. And another interesting one was when was the last recent sales email open date and also the last engagement date. So last engagement date being the date that they've engaged with something that we've put out there. So it could be an email, could be a website visit, there could be a document view, let's say. So by doing that, they're now able to tell when they're looking at their contacts in this contact view, 
is it a good time to send if, if they belong to a new deal, let's say, a new potential deal? Is it a good time to send them um, the another sequence or do they leave it? So this kind of like opened their eyes to seeing it in a particular way. So I've actually used it a few times now, especially people who are heavily using sequences as a way to understand more about the contact and before you actually take that next step. I think this is really nice. I suspect a lot of people don't know about these sequence-related fields that they can put yes. into a view and view it. So I think there's kind of a bit of a bit of a, uh, a sleeper tip of the week here. Uh, more as more people discover this and use it, it'll be really good for sales teams. All right, Craig, what's our HubSpot workflow feature of the week? Oh, just a very simple setting in workflows where you can control when actions will execute. A couple of examples in the show notes where you can say, well, instead of actions just happening anytime, which is the default, and frankly, most of the time we do that, yep. but you could say, oh, look, I only want it to be on weekdays or only in week hour, uh, day business hours and things like that. You can also say, oh, don't execute, say, on public holidays, Christmas, New Year, that kind of thing. You can get pretty granular. You could have specific days or windows, hour windows on particular days, things like that. You might only say I only want it running on two days a week, you know, the first two days. Okay, why would you do it? There might be yeah. various um, scenarios uh, for that. And especially if you're running processes or workflows that are more internal processes and sending notifications yes. and things like that. Yeah. You probably wouldn't want to limit actions if they're externally facing. Someone signs up for an ebook. Oh, no, don't send them the thank you email to Monday. <laughs> oh, that'd be a bit frustrating. So your mileage may vary. But look, there is control over it. Uh, so just highlighting that for people uh, that may or may not uh, have known about it. Yeah, and I think the other one to highlight is the upcoming dates of when to pause actions from executing that was another interesting one that i have actually never never used yeah i think public holidays is a good example of that yes. so you might pause on christmas and and some or maybe you're on a break over christmas you know so that that kind of thing holidays and it's quite nice you can get that to recur annually so you can say i oh, don't run on christmas day and in fact never on a christmas day any year so yeah so craig does that if you click annually does that automatically increment the it won't increment the date but it will know that for subsequent years on that mm. date of that month not to yep. run it yeah cool a great little tip so go check out your workflows people all right tell me craig what is the cms hub limitation of the week that you discovered oh. unknowingly <laughs> i know from the from the the why do they do this to us uh, box so child themes which are fantastic yes you you install a theme in your portal and then you create child themes from it so we run tons of websites out of our portal and we've bought a clean theme and we're creating child themes now because it supports child themes that are rolled out anyway we ran into this limitation um we're, we've got 10 child themes and we tried to create a new one i oh, know hidden limit dug around oh in the developer notes oh in an enterprise hub can only have 10 child themes i'm like why anyway i'm going to contact support i just don't understand why they have some of these arbitrary limits then so this is kind of a bit of a bit of a why do they do this i, do, I just don't understand we've got i think we've got like 25 or 26 brand domains in our portal you know, we've been really, we've been using HubSpot for close to 10 years. It's got a lot of stuff in it, right? And yet here we are, we've hit a child themes limitation. I don't understand it. Don't they want us to use it more? I actually don't understand. Anyway, I won't get too caught up on that. But if you're like me, uh, a company like ours, and you're building out lots of stuff in your portal and you've got enterprise and you're building websites and microsites and all these kind of things, just be mindful of this limitation. So here's my challenge. If you're in HubSpot and you look after CMS or you work on the CMS product, please reach out to us and let us know. <laughs> All right, Craig, what's the HubSpot gotcha item of the week? Oh, this is a beauty that you've um, unfortunately been victim of. But yeah, I'll let you explain it. That's right. I cracked my head on this for a long time. <laughs> so let's give, let's give a little bit of context here. Had a customer of ours... Um, they created a landing page for a letterbox drop 
that they were doing um, and it has a QR code to this landing page, right? They printed it, sent it out to thousands of homes and then we're looking at the page data and we're like, there's no, there's no data here. What's happened? Was this letterbox drop a dud? I'm like, it can't be. There has to be somebody. I said, we even tested it. Like we saw it there. Anyway, so not working. Can't figure out why it's not happening. Um, tested the link. Um, shared the link. Airdropped the link to friends and family uh, like yourself, Craig. Said, test this and tell me if it's working. Um, everyone said, yes, it's working for me. Only to discover after going to support a few times over that it was a preview link that was copied and used in the QR code. Now, when this happens and you see this link that says HS underscore preview, it does not log any analytics into HubSpot. And so that was the, that was the start of it. Now, what was further confusing when we were testing it is that if you're using an Apple device, to find this out, I had to go and check the URL. But if I shared that URL via AirDrop or via messages, it actually stripped the, those uh, parameters off the URL. So it looked like it was real. So you couldn't tell that it was, um, it was a preview link. So the moral of the story is make sure you do not copy preview links to be used anywhere. <laughs> so was that they, they had copied the preview link? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so they've copied the preview link. They've texted it to you. You've got an Apple device which strips off the preview parameter. So you get it and you view it and you go, oh, yeah, that's looking great for me. Yes. You've got no idea they've sent you a preview link. Correct. They then put the preview link in the QR code and, of course, then we're getting these. Sure, it works, right? They're visiting it, but it's just yes. not tracking. Yeah. And okay, so... And I guess you, you, uh, listeners might say, well, why did they send a preview link? And I guess maybe they didn't realise. Um, yes, correct. And it's very easy not to realise that you've yeah, sent a preview link. Okay. So, Wow, that is a gotcha. So that's not actually a HubSpot issue. No. That's a... Uh, <laughs> how could we actually control that? It, it's just a training issue, isn't it? Yes. Don't, Okay, and you know what? I can understand from our point of view. We're like, oh yeah, of course, it's a preview. We're we used to, it. but from their point of view, it's like, oh, that's the link I was given to go and preview it. Oh, great, here Correct. it works. They yeah. don't realize. Yeah, totally makes sense. And because a URL is l long, and you can't see if if you're using your phone and you scan yeah. a QR code, right? You're not going to see the whole URL. So unless you inspect every inch of that URL, right? it's not readily apparent. And that was it because when I did test the QR, I was like, yeah, it works. It's great. Yeah. Like that's not a problem. Go to the right place. Wow. The URL is the real URL. Right. Um, not knowing that there were all these other query parameters after the, the link. And so that comes in as direct traffic then. So let's say someone followed the link and signed up. They filled out yes. a form. Yep. On that page, let's say, I don't know if there was a form on that page. Let's assume there yes, was. Yes, there was, yeah. Right. So yeah. then they would have no tracking data in their contact activity timeline. You'd mm. see, oh, they filled out a, sub, uh, a form, yeah, but possibly not even know which page it was on. Yeah. That would be interesting to check. Wow. Anyway, there's a real life gotcha for the week. Yeah. All right. List of feedback for the week, Craig. And this is from Skylar. Um, and Skylar says, you cover the topics beyond the surface level and, and the documents you also provide are great reflection. So thank you, Skylar. Thanks, Skylar. Craig, tell me about the AI prompt of the week from Zen Oh, Create. look, just sharing another prompt. You know, we're just, we're building thousands of images and lots of stuff for clients in mid-journey. It's just fantastic. So just sharing one here and you can go actually over to our um, site and see a whole, we've got, tons of blog posts we're putting out a whole um mid-journey inspiration guide uh should be out by the time this episode's up on mid-journey prompts and inspiration yes Check it out. all right what's our thought of the week craig oh great little headline writing tip so i don't know if you follow taylor lorenz um but we saw an interview with her uh on substack and she was talking about headlines so this is a little anecdote she had 
about the importance of headlines. When she was writing for Facebook, she recounts one of the team had a headline that said, whale spotted for the second time, which is pretty boring. Anyway, the editor comes over and says, no, 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 change it to the whale that can't stay away. And it just changed the whole headline. Same story. Correct. Changed the whole headline. The whale that can't stay away. Oh, that sounds interesting kind of thing. It was just framing it. Anyway, there's a quick little tip. I think it's these little tips, which sometimes I learn much more than a whole <laughs> whole chapter in a book on headline writing. There you go. Good example. You can follow her on threads too, by the way, if you're on threads these days, folks. All right. On to our quote of the week. Now, listeners, if you don't already know, I love Formula One. I have been since I've been a kid. And so this is actually from uh, what I would call one of the greatest drivers in Formula One that, I, that I've grown up. And probably if you see me wearing some things, I even have his number on one of my shirts mm. that I wear. And you know what? It's such a good conversation starter, Craig, because people say, what does that number mean? And then I can tell them what it means. So if you do see me and you do see a number on, on my shirt, you know what it's for. But this is from Aiden Senna. And so this quote says, uh, he said, on a given day, a given circumstance, you think you have a limit. And you then go for this limit and you touch this limit and you think, oh, okay, this is the limit. And so you touch this limit, something happens and you suddenly can go a little bit further. With your mind power, your determination and your instinct and your experience as well, you can fly very high. And so he's talking about this in terms of understanding his limits while driving a Formula One car and thinking where that is, right? And, you know, if you drive, you will understand that there are limits to everything. Like if you have if you have poor tires, the limit to your traction is 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 limited and you can slide or have an accident, right? Same with your brake, same with everything that you have. So I think I wanted to relate this quote back to is that we have certain limits in HubSpot or things that we do and are we actually pushing ourselves? And what I love about our customers, Craig, and I love about having conversations with you is that we are often pushing ourselves to the limit to go, we don't have the answers, but hey, we can work it out and we can calculate and make it happen so when we think we've reached the limit i think we can always push a little bit further and find a better way to do do things yep great thought although it probably doesn't apply to child theme limits <laughs> i'll push a bit harder see if i can get past that 10 child theme limit but you're right, right you know we push you know what we do push at is things that we can control okay. so don't try and push your limits on things you can't control but i think that's right Determination. Break through our limits. Good one. All right. Now, there is some good training of the week, Craig. And what is that? So, I've been reading Ethan Mollock. He's a professor at Warden uh, School, Pennsylvania. He's a professor on innovation and business. And he has a particular focus on AI and the way businesses are using it. So, he has a good overview of the state of play of AI as of July 2023. Yep. It's changing rapidly, of course. Worth reading. He's on Substack writing there. I'm reading a lot more on Substack lately, I have to say. Which is very interesting. Yeah, the content there, it's, there's good content. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he, there's two items from that article. It's a long article, worth reading. Uh, laid out well, so you can skim it. AI is a tool, is his words. It's not always the right tool, but you consider it carefully. Weaknesses and that. It's got to be fit for purpose. So that's what you use and evaluate it with that in mind. But then also there's ethical concerns. Uh, But uh, you're responsible ultimately. So you've got to use the tools in an ethical manner. You don't kind of push away or deny responsibility. Oh, that's AI's fault. So just have that in mind. I think that's that's quite an interesting perspective because a Mm -hmm. lot of people are just pushing back and saying it's AI's fault, it's not my fault. I just used it or... I'm going to sue it for it. It's like, well, hang on. What responsibility do we have yeah. in that? I don't say, I don't think that the answers are easy. But anyway, worth a read. And also he gives good use cases for various text and image generation and actually video generation AI tools. So well worth it. 
All right, listeners, if you haven't downloaded the HubShots framework, we encourage you to do so. We've actually done a lot of sessions using the framework, Craig, haven't we? You know what? I th- I think people really the reason here's where it works. People and we were chatting about this, and I'm going to go off a little bit of a tangent here. We're chatting internally about this around content and the 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 whole transformation uh, objective that people have. So you start with information, data, facts. You try and understand that so that you get knowledge, uh, and you know processes and habits. Yeah. And then you, that leads to insights, which are around transformation. So people buy transformation. That's what they want. They start with mm-hmm. information. They get knowledge. You know, you read a book, but unless you actually understand it, you don't actually unlock an insight and transform. Yeah. One of the things about the HubShots framework, and I don't want to talk it up too much, but in that perspective is it shows people the journey that they can use with HubSpot to actually transform their business. And the biggest or the best example I've seen of this is when we get on calls, everyone wants to do attribution. Yes. I want to know what's working. I'm like, yeah, of course you do. And so you should. So it's not a criticism. It's like, yeah, of course you do. But that's a stage four to stage five part in the framework. And what the framework shows is, well, you've actually got to do all these other things to record the activity, to track the website and all of that, set that up in place so you can see attribution. Why that's useful is because then they understand. There's a bit of an insight into how to use HubSpot. And so that's just one example of the HubShots framework, guiding you through the things to focus on so you can get these big transformative outcomes at the end. Download your copy and you can book in with a call with us to chat through and we can help you understand your own portal a little bit better. But I think this framework puts it uh, in quite a nice way so that people can see that kind of maturity, that model that they need to progress through. And yes, we have heard people uh, downloading it, printing it and sticking it on the wall in the office or in their, in their office so everyone sees it and that's what I love about it. People using it and taking action. So I'll, putting I'll, HubSpot I'll, in the real world, hey Craig? HubSpot in the real world. And by the way, I'll mention because I know a lot of HubSpot partners listen to the podcast as well. You can use it with your clients. So, you know, uh, we want everyone to use it. Uh, just keep our name on it. Don't kind of... Um, wash our brand off it but use it you should if it helps you and your clients you know just use it uh, and and give us feedback we'd love to we keep improving it as well now listeners if you haven't signed up for the show notes please sign up for the show notes please follow us on uh actually subscribe to our channel on youtube and also connect with me on linkedin and you can follow craig on threads he loves posting i think when i was hanging out with craig Yesterday, he posted a few times some of the funny things that we saw. So I encourage you, as we tested measure between what we're doing and seeing what's working, so I encourage you to interact with us on these different platforms. Well, Craig, until next week. Catch you later, Ian. Bye.